In that role, Dr. Savani leads a large academic division focused on perinatal, neonatal perinatal medicine, providing care to 20,000 deliveries and 250 NICU beds per year in four hospital systems in Dallas. He has published over 80 peer-reviewed papers and is on the board, the Dallas-Fort Worth Board of the March of Dimes. Uh, welcome, Dr. Savani, and take us through our discussion today. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. I think uh, we're going to have an exciting uh, concurrent session, uh, and I'm going to uh, not stay in the way of our excellent speakers this afternoon. It, it's great pleasure to introduce Dr. Abbott Laptuk. Uh, Dr. Laptuk is the medical director of the neonatal intensive care unit at the Women's and Infants Hospital and professor of pediatrics at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, Rhode Island. In that role, Dr. Laptuk oversees the only NICU in the state uh, of Rhode Island, which cares for 1,200 to 1,300 admissions per year. And his interests are in the importance of temperature as a therapy for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and the challenges in avoiding excessively low or high temperatures at birth for high-risk infants. Uh, so please welcome uh, Dr. Abbott Laptuk, who's going to talk to us about evidence and importance of newborn thermoregulation. Uh, Dr. Lapto. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And I wanna thank uh, Rashman and thank the organizers uh, for the invitation to talk to you. This looks like an absolutely spectacular meeting. Um, I used to work in Dallas. I worked at Parkland Hospital for 23 years. And what I remember when I was leaving is that none of the nurses knew where Rhode Island was. So I wanted to show you exactly where I'm talking from. Next slide. Many of them thought I was going to Long Island. So I put an arrow in the upper right next to Long Island, but you can see Rhode Island nestled in there between Connecticut and Massachusetts. Next slide. And this is an overlay of the state of Rhode Island on the city of Houston to get, give you an idea of just how big Rhode Island is. Next slide. So the objectives of my talk is to talk about thermal regulation at birth of preterm infants, talk a little bit about the thermal neutral range, cold stress at birth, the relationship between gestational age, birth weight and cold stress, interventions to reduce cold stress and cold stress and mortality. Next slide. And this was an important editorial in the Journal of Pediatrics in 1999 which made the case that thermal management of low birth weight infant is really a pillar of uh, our care of babies every single day in the nursery. What was important about this editorial is it not only dealt with thermal regulation of infants in the nursery, but also issues of temperature at birth. Next slide. So the interest and importance of, of temperature uh, really came to light in, in the 1950s uh, as a result of a number of studies done by Bill Silverman on the effect of temperature on mortality of low birth weight infants. And he did a randomized control trial where he randomized low birth weight infants to incubator care for the first five days after birth. And they were cared for with an air temperature of 28 to 29 degrees, the norm for the day versus caring for them in a warmer environment, 31 to 32 degrees. And what was remarkable about the results was after five days, the mortality was cut almost in half by uh, caring for babies in a warmer environment. And this was a statistically significant difference, an event rate difference of 13 confidence intervals all on one side of one. Um, and when you looked at neonatal mortality, it was also different uh, because most deaths in the neonatal period occur in the first few days. So a very simple intervention had a huge impact on survival of low birth weight infants. Next slide. So what about the effects of temperature at birth on mortality? So to address this, we need to understand what's happening with temperature at birth. Uh, but first we have to start with some definitions. So um, studies to define a physiologic appropriate range of core body temperature, TC, 
have not been done, but there are studies in infants, children, and adults, uh, which indicates that the core body temperature should be 37 degrees, and there's no a priori reason for a different core temperature in newborns. And there needs to be some acceptable range to work with. The range that the WHO advocates is a range of temperatures from 36.5 to 37.5. Um, and measuring temperature from the axilla and the rectal uh, are very comparable. They're very closely correlated. Next slide. So the ideal thermal conditions for a newborn is to maintain infants in this acceptable uh, core body range, but to achieve these core body temperatures in what's known as a thermal neutral ambient range of, of, of environmental temperatures. These are the environmental condi uh, conditions which are associated with a minimal oxygen consumption and the environmental uh, conditions should be in a, uh, a steady state. And this little insert diagram on the slide shows the effects of environmental temperature along the x-axis on uh, body temperature in the top part of the panel and heat production or oxygen consumption uh, in the bottom part of the panel. And we wanna take care of premature infants in the range of thermoneutrality circled in red, we want to keep them with a core body temperature of about 37 degrees under environmental conditions where the oxygen uh, consumption or heat production is minimal because we want calories used to grow, not to be used to keep babies warm. But when a cold stress occurs, so an environmental temperature that moves towards the left on the x-axis, what happens is you get a phenomenon called chemical regulation and chemical regulation uh, is an increase in oxygen consumption or heat production to maintain the body, the body's temperature. And in newborns, they do this by a process called non-shivering thermogenesis um, and the thermogenic organ uh, is brown fat. Next slide. Uh, so what about the environmental conditions at birth? Well, if you think about the delivery room and the operating room, they're anything but a steady state thermal conditions. So they're non-steady state, and we have the absence of a thermal neutral environment. Next slide. So what happens to temperature after birth? Well, this is an old study, but it really makes the point of changes in rectal temperature uh, at intervals after birth among term vigorous infants. On the y-axis is rectal temperature, on the x-axis is time after birth. And these infants were cared for uh, with di under different conditions. The solid uh, boxes, infants were left wet and in room air. The open squares, uh, they were dried and in room air. The solid circles, infants were left wet, but on a radiant warmer. Uh, the open triangles, infants were dried uh, and cared for in a blanket. And uh, uh, the open circles, infants were dried and on a radiant warmer. So some degree of cold stress is inevitable, but very simple interventions can mitigate the extent of heat loss. And you can see that these are the forerunners of uh, uh, of the interventions uh, recommended by NRP to maintain temperature at birth. Next slide. So why does body temperature fall after birth? Well, to have a stable temperature, you need to have a thermal equilibrium. And if you have thermal equilibrium, heat production equals heat loss. So heat production is determined by a byproduct of metabolic processes, non-shivering thermogenesis, efforts to increase oxygen consumption. Heat loss are governed by uh, four physical properties, evaporation, convection, conduction, and radiant heat loss. And these are gradients of heat loss from the surface of the body to the surrounding environment. And these external gradients of heat loss are very prominent in the newborn because of the large surface area relative to body weight of a newborn compared to 
the, the importance of these factors in older children and adults. And at birth, the extent of heat loss is far greater than heat production can increase, and so body temperature falls. Next slide. So cold stress at birth is really inevitable, but some cold stress really actually has a physiologic role. Cold stimulation of cutaneous thermoreceptors on the face, for example, induce respirations and get babies breathing. And when babies are born under conditions of intrapartum fever, they have low APGARs, hypotonia, and an increased need for positive pressure ventilation because respiratory drive is suppressed. So what extent of cold stress would be expected or considered acceptable? Next slide. So this is admission temperatures among low birth weight infants from the neonatal research network of infants born in 2002 and 2003. It represents data on over 5,000 infants from 15 centers. These infants had a birth weight of less than 1,500 grams and were directly admitted uh, to the NICU. Uh, on the uh, y-axis is the percent of admission temperatures and on the x-axis is the distribution among different uh, temperature strata. And what this data indicated is that 46% of infants had an emission temperature of less than 36 degrees, definitely way too high. Next slide. This is the same data used to show the relationship between gestational age and birth weight with admission temperature. Across the top, we have gestational age, the number of babies, the birth weight, and the percent of admission temperatures. And as you can see, with decreasing gestational age and decreasing birth weight, there are fairly dramatic and prominent increases in the percent of infants with admission temperatures less than 35 and less than 36 degrees centigrade. Next slide. And again, same data set, showing the admission temperatures for individual centers of the neonatal research network. And for each center, the distribution of temperatures is plotted with different uh, shading to show uh, temperatures less than 35 degrees in black, temperatures of 35 to 35.9 in gray, temperatures 36 to 36.9 in white, and temperatures greater than 37 degrees in, in the hatched uh, part of the column. Um, and the center that had the lowest proportion of infants with uh, cold stress was center 10. Uh, and relative to center 10, the average admission temperature of other centers varied by as much as 1.5 degrees lower to as much as 0.3 degrees above. But what is the important message from this slide is that admission temperature is modifiable. Everybody can be like center 10. It's just a matter of putting the interventions into place. Next slide. So there's a number of interventions that we can use to reduce heat loss and decrease hypothermia in preterm infants at birth. NRP recommends radiant warmers, drying for infants greater than or equal to 32 weeks, the use of caps, for infants less than 32 weeks, polyethylene wraps, thermal mattresses, raising the room temperature. Not listed in NRP, but with some randomized uh, evidence to support them are the use of polyethylene caps, heated humidified gas, active maternal warming, and for resource poor uh, areas, skin to skin care. Next slide. So, 10 years after our initial survey of admission temperatures in the neonatal research network, we did the same kind of survey. And this shows the admission temperatures for infants less than 29 weeks uh, done in 2012, 2013 in the dark uh, hatched columns compared to data from 2002 to 2003 in the white hatched columns. These are centers that are common to both epochs. They're direct NICU uh, admissions uh, during both of these epochs. And what is evident in 2012 and 2013 is that uh, the, uh, the 
a proportion of infants with temperatures between 36.5 and 37.5 doubled in 2012-2013, uh, with a similar uh, reduction in proportion of temperatures less than 36.5, a reduction in the temperature in the admission temperatures of of less than 35, but interestingly, a small increase in admission temperatures above uh, 37.5 and above 38, from two to six percent. So when you're putting interventions into place uh, to try to combat hypothermia, the flip side is you have to be careful about overheating these infants. Next slide. So cold stress at birth is common among preterm infants. The frequency and the severity of cold stress increase with decreasing gestational age and birth weight. Over a decade, the extent of cold stress has been reduced, but does it matter? Next slide. So we used our data from the surveys of admission temperatures uh, in the neonatal research network to look to see if there were associations between admission temperature and mortality uh, in that data set. And we used multivariable logistic regressions we, where we adjusted for antenatal steroids, sex, race, birth weight, intubation, APGAR scores, and center. And from the data in 2002 and 2003, what we found is that for every one degree centigrade decrease in emission temperature, mortality increased by 28%. For the data from 2012, 2013, we expressed it in the opposite fashion. For every one degree centigrade increase in emission temperature, mortality decreased by 19%. Uh, so there's very prominent inverse associations, but these are just associations. It doesn't imply causal inference. Next slide. So that takes us to the HELP trial. The HELP trial is the heat loss prevention in preterm infants, which asks the question, do occlusive wraps immediately after birth reduce mortality. Um, and the design was to, uh, res uh, to uh, create two groups with different temperatures and see if those two groups had different uh, extensive mortality. This was a prospective randomized trial for infants 24 to 27 weeks stratified by gestational age. The primary outcome was all cause mortality. Uh, the study, uh, enrolled 817 infants, half of them randomized to occlusive wraps, in addition to care on a radiant warmer, dry in the head and a cap. Uh, and the other half were randomized to no wrap, care on a radiant warmer, drying of the body and the head and a cap. Next slide. These are the results. The trial was actually stopped uh, after 50% enrollment. They were to enroll 1,600 infants. There were differences between the groups as shown by the, uh, uh, the plot in the upper right. The wrap group had a higher temperature on emission, 36.3 versus 35.7. But when you looked at mortality, they were almost identical, 20.5% for the wrap group, 20% for the non-wrap group. When you did uh, adjusted uh, regressions, there was no difference uh, between the two groups in mortality. So wrapping, had no benefit to reduce mortality, but yet in the lower right, when you look at the relationship between temperature on the x-axis, mortality uh, on the y-axis, there again is this inverse association. As admission temperature dropped, uh, there's an association with a higher mortality. Next slide. So the NRN and the HELP trial are not the only ones to report inverse associations between admission temperature and in-hospital mortality. It's also been observed in the Epicure study, the California Perinatal Quality Care Collaborative, the Brazilian Network of Neonatal Research, and the Canadian Neonatal Network. It's important to note, though, that uh, this is an association. We don't know if a low admission temperature actually causes mortality or is just a risk factor for mortality. Next slide. 
And finally, there's a very uh, interesting paper from the Canadian Neonatal Network, uh, which reported on close to 10,000 infants. They, moved it, they looked at the associations between admission temperature on the x-axis and a composite outcome of mortality or any major uh, neonatal morbidity. And they were able to identify this uh, very interesting U-shaped association where the lowest rates of their uh, uh, composite outcome occurred with admission temperatures between 36.5 to 37.2 and higher rates of these adverse outcomes um, at the extremes of temperature. Next slide. So in conclusion, thermal regulation is a fundamental principle in the care of newborns at birth and in the NICU. Uh, cold stress is common at birth. A little bit is necessary. It stimulates respirations. Too much, you end up with this inverse association with mortality. Um, but these are associations with mortality and we're not sure whether it's causally related uh, versus uh, a marker. And admission temperature is modifiable. We need vigilance for hyperthermia. Next slide. And I want to thank you for the invitation to speak to you. Thank you, Dr. Ab uh, Dr. Labtuk. That was great. Um, uh, and an inspiration for some of the other stuff that we've done. I'll remind folks that um, uh, we will have a roundtable discussion uh, where all the speakers will be present later on. Um, so it's a real pleasure to uh, move to uh, Dr. Henry Lee.